Okay, introduce speaker. Let me rearrange here. Um, I believe that introduces introduce and speakers speak, so I give you Patrick. Stay right there, isn't it? Um, my name's Patrick, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I've been sober since uh, January 12th, 2015, this time. And um, hopefully that's the one I keep. Um, Daryl's not here. Thank you, Daryl, uh, wherever you are, <laughs> for asking me to speak this morning. On the second string, you're supposed to have a different speaker this morning, but she couldn't make it, so uh, the B player showed up. Um, so, my... Um, I'll just jump in. My first drink um, was when I was 14 years old. I, um, I'm gonna try not to trip over this cord. Um, I was in a park in uh, Chickasha, Oklahoma, with my, yes, <laughs> everything good happens in Chickasha, Oklahoma, uh, with my three very best friends, uh, Chris, uh, Dirk, and Todd, and we had decided that we were going to drink that day. They had had their drinks before, but this was gonna be my very first drink. And I was really excited about this first drink because I'd been looking forward to it for a very, very long time. Um, and I don't even, I don't even really know why exactly. I mean, I knew why I wanted the second drink because I'd had the first and I knew what it did, but I didn't know what the first drink was going to do yet. Um, I think, um, well, first of all, my, my grandfather was a pastor. Um, so we grew up in, in the church all the time. Um, if it was open, we were there. If it wasn't open, we opened it and then we were there. Um, my grandfather was a pastor. My uncle was a pastor. Uh, another uncle was in a gospel traveling band. My mother was in a gospel trio. Uh, she was in the choir. I was in the choir. We all taught Sunday school. So we were heavily involved in the church. And um, they told me that drinking was a sin. And I hadn't done that sin yet, but all the sinning that I'd done up to that point was really fun. I really enjoyed all of the things that I'd done. And they, and being a teenage boy, um, I hope this isn't too inappropriate, but there were two sins at the top of the list. Um, I hadn't done either of them yet. I had high hopes for one of them, and they put drinking with that one. Um, so I was really looking forward to this if it was compared to that. Um, and I was a, nobody ever described me as a pleasant child. Nobody ever said, gosh, we can't wait till Patrick gets here because he's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, I was a very angry, um, just disappointed all the time in everyone. Um, nothing ever seemed as though it was going right. Um, at eight years old, I knew how y'all were supposed to be doing things and you weren't doing anything the way I thought you should be doing it. And, um, and so that's just the kind of kid I was. Um, I, I've been told that maybe normal people have the ability to let things go. I was not born with the ability to let anything go. Um, everything that anybody had ever said about me, done to me, hurt my feelings, things that happened on the playground, things that my family, all of it I kept. And one of my favorite things to do, period, was, is, um, lay in bed at night and think about how I'm going to get them all back. <laughs> that's just, that's one of my, this has always been one of my favorite things to do. I do it much less now than I used to, because uh, I'm a little healthier now than I used to be, thank God. Um, but that's just the kind of kid I was. So, um, we're in the park, my three best friends and I, and, and we've got scotch in a big gulp uh, cup that we were passing around. We stole the scotch, like you do. Um, from Todd's uh, father's office and um, it starts coming around and I'm really excited about this drink that's coming around and it goes from Chris to Dirk to Todd to me and I take a drink 
and this thing that I'd been waiting on, this thing that was supposed to be glamorous and that I was going to do, basically as a career I had decided, I was just going to go around looking cool and drinking, um, was the most horrible tasting, nastiest stuff I'd ever put in my, la my mouth, and I passed it to Chris, and my feelings were hurt, it tasted so bad. <laughs> um, but it comes back around, and I'm not a quitter, so I take another long pull on that straw, the longest I could possibly take, um, so we just get this thing over with, and I pass it around, and before it comes back around again, it happens. The magic that alcohol does for me happened for me in that moment. I'm 14 years old with my three closest friends in the world. I do everything with these guys. We laughed, we camped, we slept over, we did movies, everything. And when it hit me, I was closer to them than I had ever been before. I talked more, I talked louder, I laughed more, I laughed harder, everything changed. Uh, Dr. Silkworth called it an effect produced by alcohol, and that is an understatement. Ease and comfort doesn't cover it. This stuff rearranged my soul. Um, and I was in the world differently. I was comfortable for the first time ever. I didn't have those words then, but I got them here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was comfortable for the first time in my own skin. Um, and that's pretty amazing. Um, for a beverage, liquid in a cup, to do that. Um, and so, of course I'm going to do that every day for the rest of my life. Um, I don't think I made a conscious decision in that moment to do that every day for the rest of my life, but I did it as often as I possibly could, because why wouldn't I? I mean, I couldn't understand why other people weren't doing it every day for the rest of their lives. Like, I felt like I found the secret to get getting for being. I thought I'd found the secret for being. Um, and so um, fast forward, I'm drinking every day, literally a daily drinker in high school. Go off to college. Um, I'm a freshman in college. I'm a freshman at college. I'm not gonna say in college because <laughs> apparently you're supposed to go to the classes. People told me, and this is what I heard, alcoholic brain, um, people said, your professors don't really care if you go to class. The rest of that statement is, they don't care if you go to class, they will just fail you. <laughs> and so they did. Um, and I ended up, at the end of my freshman year, with a GPA somewhere around one, which is not the number you're supposed to have, apparently. Um, and my parents said, okay, well, we're not gonna do that anymore. Um, you get to come back home and go to this little school in our hometown, which I did. And that was really my first consequence. I'd had no consequences up to that point. Um, I, got great, I got great grades in, in high school. I played sports. I was drunk every day, pretty much. But I got up and shook it off and did the, the teenager. Who cares? Um, first consequences. So what I learned from that was you're going to have to figure out how to get these people off your back. And that was how I addressed the world. Just get these people off your back so you can go about doing the things you want to do the way you want to do them. Um, and so I did that. And uh, got through school, uh, got married before I got out of school. Uh, we had a child in um, January of 1993, a beautiful little boy. Um, it's too early for this. Um, <laughs> And there's no Kleenex. Oh, yeah, there is. Okay, good. We're going to need that. Um, and just continued on. I mean, um, we, uh, that marriage did not work out. Uh, we got divorced. Um, shortly after we got divorced, I thought, I might be gay. And Turns out that's a big reason why we got divorced. I didn't know that really at the time. Because there are things that my, my very first sponsor explained to me that there were things that husbands and wives did that my wife and I didn't do. Um, that I really had no interest in doing. Um, and so that marriage didn't work out. So um, I think I might be gay. I go and I find this gay bar. 
so it was a mixed bar, kind of half straight, half gay, and it was kind of cool in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I lived at the time. And I got a whole bunch of new freedom that I had never felt before. Um, Cause it was, this is the mid nineties in Oklahoma, and in Oklahoma you subtract 20 from whatever the year is, so 1996 is 1976. And um, it's really just not safe at that point for gay people in Oklahoma. And um, so I find these bars and there's no rainbow flags or anything like that. It's just a building with a blacked out window that you open the door and you go inside. And it is the most fabulous people with the absolute best music and the best drinks and that door closes behind you and you're free. And then I go to the bar and I get the drinks and I'm even more free. And so now I'm never going to leave this place. And so I'm in that place or someplace like it every night for a number of years. Um, during that time, my ex-wife found out that I was gay, am gay, still gay. Um, <laughs> and then my family, the religious conservatives from Oklahoma found out that I'm gay. And in six months, um, my, I was back in court, no custody of the little boy. Um, the family said, you don't belong to us anymore. My grandfather said, you can go ahead and change your last name too because I don't want to blank with my last name. And I haven't seen most of them since then. Um, and so pretty much every tether that held me to planet Earth was cut and I was in the world, free and floating around and no place to land and nowhere to belong. But I had one thing that helped me belong no matter where I was, and that was booze. And I had one place that I belonged no matter what, and that was a bar. And so I was in a bar drinking booze as often as I possibly could. Um, in, uh, you know, in how it works, it describes alcohol as cunning and baffling and powerful, and I add the words liar and thief to that string of words. Because the lie is um, that just drink me and you can feel this good every time, as long as you want, no matter what. And then eventually it stops. And the thievery is Every time I do that, it takes a little slice away from me. And it's so small and it's so slow and it's so gradual that I don't even know what it's taken. I don't know how much it's taken until all of a sudden one day I turn around and everything's gone. And so in these gay bars, I found gay friends, which are very fun. And we found circuit parties and I started doing all the things I said I was never going to do. I did the powders and the pills and all the other things you do when you're at circuit parties and other kinds of parties and um, I did that for three years straight and um, burned it all to the ground, took everything and my solution to that was I knew I woke up one day in Tulsa, Oklahoma and I said you gotta stop doing these drugs and you gotta get out of this town. So I got out of that town. That's all I could figure out, that's all I could do at the time. So I ended up in Dallas, Texas, and um, there I was, I was still me. Here I am, I'm still me. And I found the very, I was here, it was January 13th, 2004. It was a Tuesday night, I knew one person in Dallas, and I called him and I said, where do you go on a Tuesday night? And he said, the hideaway bar. And I said, I'll see you there, where is it? And I went to the hideaway bar and I missed the hideaway bar. Still to this day, it was an awesome place. Um, and um, I got drunk. First day, imagine that. Um, and I kept, I kept being me, because nothing had changed, except the location. Um, and I just kept going and kept going. I was, um, <sighs> but here's where God comes in. Um, so I never, Really, I'd heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'd seen it on television. A bunch of losers in a circle in a room like this, <laughs> talking about their problems and how nothing worked out and here's what happened and poor me. And I was like, that just didn't sound fun at all. 
Um, but turns out I knew somebody else in Dallas. I didn't even know he was down here. A guy that used to live in Tulsa, he had moved down here, and he had a boyfriend. And we were at JR's one night, and his boyfriend and his boyfriend's friend were there, and they had bottles of water. I was like, well, that's very odd. Um, and then it turns out that they didn't drink at all, and they went to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, that's very interesting. They didn't look anything like that group of people that was sitting in that circle on TV. They were fun, and they were having a good time, and they had great personalities, and um, the friend of the boyfriend was very cute. <laughs> and I'm strung out on all kinds of drugs and all kinds of drinking, and I could not figure out why he did not want to go out with me. Um, I found out later why. Um, but that was my first introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous, or just a little seed, and my, and my relationship with God is, um, he just starts throwing pebbles on the window. Hey, wake up, wake up. And when the pebbles don't work, he starts throwing rocks and then bricks, and then eventually I get hit with a boulder. And I'm someone that likes boulders, apparently, because um, the pebbles never work. And, and so that was my first introduction to people that were sober and alcoholics anonymous. Um, I was in JR's. Not long after that, another guy comes along and just clotheslines me right in the throat on purpose. And so we were together for three years. <laughs> and he, he drank like I drink. And I'm like, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. Um, he got sober later too. Um, when that relationship broke up, um, I decided that I'm going to write a book. I lived, um, this was 2006. And because I had all this wisdom and knowledge that the world really needed. And I wrote that book and it was absolute crap. Um, none of you will ever see it. Um, and I decided to write this book, but I was drinking every day heavily. I drank myself to sleep every night. Um, two or three bottles of wine, because wine was okay. Everybody drinks wine at home. Doesn't matter how much, as long as it's wine. Um, but I knew if I stayed at home, I was going to drink myself to sleep. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to go somewhere, and I go looking for a Starbucks, because that's apparently where cool people open their laptop, laptops and just write things and be free. And so I'm living in East Dallas at the time, and I pass one Starbucks, and that one's not right. And I go to another Starbucks, and that one's not right. And I'm Goldilocks in all these Starbucks. Um, and I end up over here on Lemon Avenue at Lemon and Nine. And I go in there one evening, and I was like, there's like four people in there. It's like, perfect. It's well lit. There's hardly anybody there. I'll go in. I'll write. Everything will be fine. So I go in. There's this group of guys over in this corner that were laughing and carrying on and they were all nice looking people, great personalities. I was very intrigued. And so I went back the next night, the next night, the next night. And they were there every night it seemed. And finally we started talking and they would leave. And I was like, are you, where are you guys going? Are you going to JR? It's like, no, 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 we're going to a meeting. I'm like, what kind of meeting? Is it this late at night? He said, we're going to, we're in AA. We're going to over to a group called, a place called Lambda, they said. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just kept, did I just unplug something? Yes. Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> I'm back. Um, and so, I'm like, we'll just pretend like I never met those people. And, um, but I'm still intrigued, so I go back, and one day I go after work, and it's like 5, 5.30 in the afternoon, and this Starbucks is full with at least this many people, and there are tables with big books open, and people talking code. <laughs> that I've never, how many days you got? Oh, I got 30 days. You're going to get your chip? No, I'm going to get my chip on Saturday. You're going to the 6th? No, I'm going to the 8th. I'm like, what are you people talking about? <laughs> and so I go back again and again and again. And over the period of the next three years, I began auditing the program of Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> through Starbucks. And, 
it ends up like almost all my friends, I've got two sets of friends, a small set of friends that I drink with, and I've got all these friends that are sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am nowhere close to being sober. But I would drag myself out of bed at, eight, at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday because this group of guys is going to be there. It's still not time to cry. <laughs> this group of guys is going to be there at Saturday morning talking, having a good time. And they weren't hungover. Their eyes weren't bloodshot. And they had... I didn't, again, I didn't have the words then, but I have them now. They had something that I wanted. And this is my sponsor, right? <laughs> and then the tears go away. Um, I didn't know how to get it. And I thought, I'll just hang out with these guys, and these guys are my friends, and eventually I'm going to be like them. That didn't work either. And so one day I talked to, uh, are there any birthdays? How long ago? No, okay. Um, I talked to a guy and I said, I think I might need to go to one of these meetings. And he said, I was wondering how long this was going to take. I said, I want to go to a meeting where no one will be there because I don't want anybody to see me. <laughs> All my friends are sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so we go to a Sunday 1 o'clock meeting on January 25th of 2009, 2009. And I pick up a Zyre chip and I say, my name's Patrick, I'm an alcoholic for the first time. And here's the thing about those first four years. I was pretty sure I was an alcoholic. And that's not enough. Um, and I thought, by the way, here's a little nugget. And sometimes nuggets feels like, feel like rocks when they hit you. But here was a nugget that was given to me early in sobriety. He said, um, Patrick, and it's never good when they start with your name. Patrick, anything that comes after the words I thought or I think, let's go ahead and throw that away. Ouch. Um, so I thought um, I could come in here and just sit in a chair and be with you guys and I'll go to coffee and I'll go to dinner and I'll be on the Big D Roundup Committee and I'll be the secretary of the group and I'll do all these things and then I'll be sober. And what that got me was dry. I just hadn't had a drink. I glanced through the steps. I did an inventory, I did a fifth step, and I made some amends, and I did some stuff, and then I stopped. And what that gets me, an alcoholic like me, is it gets me drunk. Because um, I know today that if I don't make these steps my life, if they don't become how I live my life, I will absolutely drink again. And that's what I did. Um, the scheme, my scheme, didn't work. And so, four years sober, um, I plan my escape from Alcoholics Anonymous. And there was a good deal of planning involved because I was going to go out. And I didn't want to just leave you guys in the lurch, called meetings, meet for coffee, sending emails, letting people know that I'm not really an alcoholic. Thank you for your time, thank you for your concern, but I'm going to go out here and continue on with my life. And some of those people are in this room right now. Um, and so I did, and um, relapse doesn't have to be a part of your story. It didn't have to be a part of mine, um, but it is a part of mine. And when I got back, I didn't want it to be a part of mine. It was very painful. It was very embarrassing. There was a lot of shame around it. Um, I nearly died. Um, but today, standing here, um, I'm grateful for it because I, there is absolutely no way on God's green earth that I would have the sobriety that I have today, that I would have the connection with God that I have today if I hadn't gone through what I'd gone through. 
so it's my story. And um, so I went out and I was out for two years. And in those two years, all the things that it says happened in the big book happened to me. I thought gates of insanity or death, that's a little dramatic. Um, I found insanity, I nearly found death. I tried to hang myself with a belt and the belt broke and I fell to the ground. And um, that's where alcoholism takes me. Um, I was, an, I was, I, was I, I wouldn't even describe myself as a daily drinker when I got back. I was an hourly drinker. Uh, I drank in the morning, I drank at lunch, in the afternoon, I drank in the evening, dinner time, night time. When I went to bed at night, there was bourbon on the nightstand because when I woke up at two or three or four o'clock in the morning, I was going to have to have more bourbon or whatever was there so I could get maybe an hour or two more sleep that night. And uh, desperation, I don't even think that word is big enough. Um, to describe where I was and where I was for a while. I was there for a few months. Um, I ended up on um, some antidepressants and all kinds of stuff that kept me alive, uh, kept me from trying to kill myself. And I'm in the car one afternoon, um, should not have been driving a car that afternoon, but I was in it. And um, I don't remember if I said it out loud or I just thought it, but the words were, why doesn't anything work? And the voice that I got, or the intuitive thought that I got, was because there's not a pill for alcoholism. And God comes back into the story here, and um, one of my favorite descriptions of God's grace was given by a Benedictine monk, monk uh, brother. Robert something. He describes it as the absolute expression of perfect love, offering God's healing and love that I can either reject, accept, or ignore. And I can simply accept it. It's just there. And so in the car that day when I, when I got that intuitive thought, I in that moment said, I'm going back to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a Sunday afternoon. There's a Monday, six o'clock newcomer meeting tomorrow. I am going. And I made a real decision because I knew I was going to do it. And God doesn't really hear my words, listen to my words. I believe God hears the intent in my heart. And I knew it was true. And God, and God knew it was true. One moment, please. <laughs> um, and when people tell me the miracles don't happen in Alcoholics Anonymous, I would love to sit down and have a conversation with them. Because the hourly drinker that existed on January 10th, on Sunday, January 11th, is different. From the moment I made that decision, I have not wanted to drink since then. I didn't drink the rest of that day. There was no bourbon on the nightstand that night. When I went to bed at night, I woke up the next morning, having slept all night, excited. I hadn't woken up excited in months and months and months, maybe years, because I was coming home. And that's what it felt like. You guys have become my family. You've shown me how to live successfully. And what that means for me is that I get to be a human being, which was aspirational at one point in my life. Um, I get to, I got to begin to learn to be the God God would have me be, to be the person God would have me be. And so I came in and that first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on January 12th of uh, 2015, it was a newcomer meeting and it was a small meeting. Uh, there were maybe 10 or 12 people in the, in the whole room and half of those people had over 20 years in a newcomer meeting because that's where they knew the newcomers were. And they were there for me. 
And some of those people are here in this room. And um, I launched, which is the correct word, um, into this program, to this way of life. I got a sponsor within a very few days. Um, I walked into Sunday Morning Live when I was six days sober, when it was still downstairs, and you guys didn't tell me you'd change the time. I got here at 1045, and the only person here was Travis, and I walked in, and Travis looked at me. I don't see him here, but he, say, he looked at me, and he said, what happened? Because <laughs> when I got here, um, I weighed 225 pounds now. I weighed about 180 then. Um, that's a big difference. Um, I was yellow and gaunt. Um, my cheeks, cheeks were sunken in. Um, shaking still at six days. And, um, and I, I didn't have an answer. I said, I don't know. I met with my sponsor, my first sponsor, two days later, and he said, what do you think happened? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to find out so it didn't have to happen again. And we launched into the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we worked them um, quickly and vigorously. And... Um, Step one and two were really pretty simple. Um, step one was, I mean, if you got two eyes, you can, you can see step one and me at that point. Um, and we talked about it. And um, step two was, step two he made really easy because he knew um, at, uh, I was probably 14, 20 days sober, somewhere in the room, we got to step two, He's, he, didn't, he knew that I was not capable of any deep philosophical conversations. He said, um, do you think if you do this thing, you might get what I got? I said, yeah, I hope. He said, good, step three. And he went, I went home and I read step three every day in the 12 and 12, and I came back and did some stuff in the big book. And I came back, he said, um, we talked for a while, and he said, do you want this thing to work for you the way it worked for me? I said, yeah, I do want it. He said, are you willing to do what I did to get what I got? And I said, yes, I am. He said, call him one. <laughs> and so he showed me how to do the four step, and I went through the columns like we do, and um, I'm about two months sober-ish, I mean, when I do my fifth step, maybe, maybe six weeks sober, somewhere in there. And talk about forgiveness for a second. Um, I had a lot of people I thought that I needed to forgive. Um, and I didn't know what forgiveness was. That's so, so many things, I think I know what they are. When I get here, I have absolutely no idea what they are. I think I know what words mean, and I have no idea what the words mean. And so we looked up forgiveness, and forgiveness was just my willingness to give up my need to punish somebody. Can I give up claim of requital? Can I, can I decide that, yeah, they did something to me, and I still don't like it, and I might not ever like them. But the thing they did, can I stop needing to punish them for it? Maybe I can get there. And so we, I did this exercise of, um, started with my ex-wife, because that was going to be the hardest one. Um, and I couldn't even see a person anymore. All I saw was what she did. I didn't see her humanity anymore. And so he said, write down, start writing down a list of all of her good qualities. I said, well, that's going to be a really short list. <laughs> and I was like, I don't even know if I can come up with two or three. And so we got down and I start, you know, I start making the list. She was a good mom to our son. She was that. And she planned a nice wedding. We had a really nice wedding and line three and line four and line five and then they just kept coming and kept coming and the second page and the third page and I wound up with all these good qualities that this person had that I had 
completely wiped out because all I could see was the thing that she did. And when she became a human, then I could see maybe she's sick. Maybe she's operating with some views that she's been given. Maybe she's making decisions based on those that she can't help. I've done that. I could see myself in that. And then all of a sudden I gave up my need to punish her. I gave up my claim of, claim of requital. And I'd forgiven her. Um, two years ago, three years ago, my son, um, now old enough to get married, was become engaged to a girl he met in rehab. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't last. Um, but my ex-wife and I, at this point, we're texting back and forth. What are we going to do for the wedding? How are we going to do this? I'll pay for this. You pay for that. Oh my gosh, we might be grandparents. I said, well, if it's a boy, you can spoil it. If it's a girl, she's mine. Because you can't even keep up. And we're laughing. And this is the kind of... Now, we're not best friends. But when we do have contact, that's the kind of contact we get to have today. Because of the healing that takes place in Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys say that to me. We did the same thing for my parents. My parents became people instead of disapproval and shun, which is all I saw. And when I saw that my mother was my grandfather's daughter, so she's operating with what, what he gave her. She had really no, no power to make any decision other than the one she made. I've done that. I could see that in her. She, came, she became a person. She became a mother again. She, was, she had already passed away, but I could forgive her. And I moved on. That's freedom. When the, that first ninth step promise, a new freedom and a new happiness. I've gotten countless new freedoms over and over and over again. And they started in the fourth and fifth step, the very first one. And they just, they just keep coming. Um, fifth step, very freeing. Um, and the biggest thing I got from that at the time was I felt the sense of accomplishment. Like I'd done, I'd gotten over the hurdle. I'd done the fourth and the fifth step. I'm still here. I didn't go out. Um, and I felt like I'd earned my seat. I'm like, I'm, I'm actually doing this deal. I'm one of you people now. I got my ticket. Fifth step ticket. And, um... We, did, we went on and we did six and seven and we did, did the prayer and we did eight and nine. And the ninth step, um, direct amends are really important. Direct amends, face to face. Um, because I got to, I had the opportunity now, as painful as it was, I will call it the privilege, um, to sit across the table or sit in a chair next to someone and make direct amends to someone that I had harmed immensely. I was sitting there and talking to them and I could see the pain that I'd caused them on their face. Something that I had done years ago, still causing them tears. And in the ninth step, I decided, not only do I want to stay sober, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the guy that causes that much pain in another human being. And I think it's really important, for, it was really important for me to have that experience in the ninth step because now I've got to decide am I going to actually live this way of life. In the four to the, of the uh, 12 and 12, it says that this, this program, this group of principles that have practiced as a way of life will expel the obsession to drink and enable me to become happily and usefully whole. The obsession to drink is gone, but how do I become happily and usefully whole? That's what I want. The guy that caused that much pain, he can't be happily and usefully whole. He can't be useful. He's going around hurting people all the time. And so... Now I've got to decide to do this thing on a daily basis, 10, 11, and 12. And um, my first sponsor, when we would, when we would meet after that, he's, he would say, the question was, are we 10, 11, and 12-ing? I said, yes, we are. 
And he said, um, are you doing your daily inventory? I said, yep. He said, are you praying and meditating? I said, I'm praying. <laughs> he said, are you praying and meditating? I'm like, I don't know how to meditate. I don't even know. I'm not good at it, which is the perfect cop-out answer. I'm not good at it. Um, and so he said, you got to... He said, you got to start. Because any time you would say, I don't know how to do something, he said, hey, well, you start doing it, and then you keep doing it. Oh, that's sponsor riddles. I don't like sponsor riddles. Um, and he would say, um, then he said, have you ever been in a relationship with someone, friend or romantic or otherwise, that just talked and talked and talked and never listened? I said, yes, I have. Let me tell you about him. He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> he said, stop talking and listen. That's meditation. And I've gone through lots of different types of meditation, looking for the thing that works for me. And um, I have three practices that I use regularly now. Um, that are absolutely life-changing, completely life-changing. The thing that alcohol did for me that caused me to be, to be able to be comfortable in my skin no matter where I am, meditation does that for me today. Um, it steps one, one, uh, four through nine and ten are meant to get as much of me out of the way as possible. As much of the stuff that's between me and God out of the way as possible. So that the decision that I made in step three can be made possible, can come to fruition in step 11. One decision at a time, one day at a time, I learn to listen and align my will with God's will. And I don't have any idea what God's will is. The vast majority of the time. The only thing I know how to do is say, God, what do I do here? And the longer I've meditated, and the longer I've lived this way of life, and the longer, longer I've had a relationship with God, the easier it is for, for me to hear those answers. For me to get that intuitive thought, the thing that comes from in here, which is where God is. So that I can just do the next right thing. And that's all God's will is for me. Just, Patrick, do the next right thing. Stop being an asshole. Stop being a jerk. Um, and along the way of doing this thing and, and living this way of life, I've found the care of God in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not some big um, esoteric sort of thing. It's the thing that I just find in my day-to-day -day life. That God has always taken care of me no matter what. God has taken care of me and saying, go this way. Maybe you ought to do that, a little nudge, a little hint. And I'll do the next right thing, time after time after time. Somewhere along the road, I end up where God would have me be. I don't have to know what it is. All I have to do is be willing to do the work. And then I wind up where God wants me. I can tell you today that my life is not at all what I had planned. Um, thank God. Because um, it is so much more. A um, couple of minutes on my first year of sobriety, um, while I was doing all this work, um, going through the steps for the first time, um, I got to AA just in time. Um, things were pretty bad, but right when I got sober, the wheels fell off the train. Um, in the first couple of months, I wound up unexpectedly single. Uh, my boyfriend and I lived together at the time. Um, extremely unemployed. Um, very unemployable. Um, and so I'm two, two months, three months, four months sober and during this time I've got no job and no money. I got no place to live. I got no car to get anywhere. Um, never wanted to drink. Not one time. Um, I was too busy doing this stuff. I had people that came by and said, when's the last time you were at a meeting? I said, uh, whenever it was. And they said, we're coming by to get you. And I was at a meeting. 
And there's a line on page 127 that says um, something to the fact that our material life um, straightens out after our spiritual life does, never before. Um, and that's what happened for me. I was given the chance to get sober and find God and find a new way of living. And as I kind of sobered up and become, became a little bit more of a human, then life started falling back into place. And God never gave me, has never given me anything that I couldn't handle in both directions. Um, I found a, an ad, an Uber ad for Uber drivers. I had two undergraduate degrees and an MBA, an Uber driver. I may have prayed for humility if don't do that. <laughs> um, and this ad was, we'll get you a car if you'll drive for us, basically. Lease a car through Uber. I'm like, I don't have a car. That's a job. I have no place to get to a job. Should I do this? The answer was yes. So I go, and I go to the dealership where they do that Uber thing, and I got a car. And now I'm driving for Uber every day. And I'm driving for Uber 12 to 14 hours a day because I know what I've got to do to get enough money to get, to get a place. So I do that. And I'm doing that, and I'm doing that, and I'm getting sober and staying sober and you know, getting my connection with God, and that's getting better. And I get a call from the lady that I used to work with. It was a partner in the firm that I used to be a partner in the firm before they got tired of me and said, no more of you. And she said, you know, I started this company with another guy a couple of years ago. We've got some work coming in that we don't really know how to do. Do you have time? And I'm still an alcoholic. And I said, I can probably work you in. <laughs> I said, it's only about 10 hours a week. I said, I, perfect. I really don't have much more time than that anyway. And so I started doing this work. And then it's more work and it's more work. And the more, the closer I get to God, the more, a little more sane I get, the more work I get. And a year goes by and the, the, the head guy at that firm says, you know what, you're here so much anyway, would you consider just becoming a partner in the firm? And that'll be that. Yes, I would do that. <laughs> and so I signed the operating agreement and I was a partner in that firm. And another year goes by and um, our clients want more of the work that I do. That guy didn't want to do that. So the lady and I said, well, what if we just kind of start our own, our own company? And I said, I think that might be a good idea. Let me, get, let me get back to you. So I prayed and meditated and talked to some people and I went back to her and I said, I think that's a really good idea. Let's do that. That was three years ago. We're about to celebrate our fourth anniversary of the company. And um, it straightened out as I straightened out spiritually. God has never given me more than I could take care of in either direction. Um, he has always taken care of me. Um, you guys have given me a way to live that is miraculous. Miracles still happen in my life all the time. Um, it is a privilege for me to stand up here today, this person um, who couldn't go more than a few hours with a drink 2,387 days ago, um, to stand up here before you and say, thank you. Um, I heard my Angela say once that the two best words that you can say to another human being are the same words you say to God. So, thank you for my sobriety. Thank you for my...